So the, the webinar is going to be focused on property and casualty insurance, specifically related to homes um, and uh, homeowners insurance and anything related to that, such as like earthquake insurance. Um, uh, I have a co-presenter today. Uh, his name is John Gardner. He has his own insurance practice. It's called JSG Insurance Services. Uh, and I've known John for a couple years now, and I found him to be a true expert in insurance and in all insurance-related matters. Um, and what I like about John is that he takes a financial planning approach to insurance to make sure that all of his clients um, are completely covered. Uh, and, and he knows how the insurance company works, so he knows how to better assign and and, and um, cover his clients because he knows the ins and outs of the insurance business. So without further ado, I will let John uh, take over, say a little bit about himself, and then get the webinar started. Great, Matt. Thank you very much. Well, welcome, everyone. A um, little bit about myself. I've been in the insurance industry for, gosh, coming up on 30 years now. Um, worked insurance corporate insurance, so I learned the inside of the business, and then I was a farmer's agent for 11 years, and then I opened my own brokerage about five years ago. So I've kind of seen all aspects of insurance, dealt with many different situations, and I think it really, um, what I really want to do today is spend some time sharing some of that experience with you in a practical manner so that you benefit from the time you've spent with us today. So first of all, I want to congratulate you for taking the time today because this is one of those topics that people just don't really think about often. And I kind of have a personal philosophy, which is it's really important to understand your coverage before you have the loss. There's nothing like getting a phone call where somebody, you know, their house has been burglarized or they've had a loss at their house and they're calling me up and they're like, am I covered for this? And, and there, there's always a panic in their voice. And I think being able to address it up front um, is a better way to go because then you can know what you're covered for and what you're not and make a good business decision about that. Um, let's go kind of a little bit of a roadmap of what we're going to talk about today. Um, let's see here. Get the Okay, so first of all, we're going to do a little overview of property and casualty insurance. Um, what are property and casualty insurance? What does it mean? What type of insurances are involved? Um, as Matt said, we're going to spend most of our time talking about homeowners insurance. Um, this is particularly given the recent events with the fires and the floods and the things that have happened recently. Um, I think it's top of mind and an important topic for people to be giving thought to. Some related insurance coverages. So we'll also be talking about uh, condo insurance and insurance for landlords and the earthquake insurance and some of those things that may not pertain exactly to your primary home, but might also be important, um, especially if you have those kinds of properties as well. We're going to talk about liability insurance, which is part of your home policy and a little bit what it does and how it works and how to best utilize that. And when we do that, we're also going to talk about umbrella coverage because that's one of those coverages I think most people don't fully understand but would truly benefit um, by having a policy like that. And then we'll wrap up with some Q&A at the end. So um, again, appreciate everybody joining us this morning. Um, let's go ahead and start talking about what is property and casualty insurance. So what we've yeah. done here, one, one thing I wanted to clarify, everybody, sure. you can a ask, type your questions in your uh, the dialog box um, and we'll see those and we'll answer them. Um, if they're applicable to the current slide, we'll try to ask them in real time so to keep it keep everybody engaged. And um, if not, we'll ask ask your questions and we'll have a Q&A at the very end uh, okay. of, the, of the webinar. And Matt, you'll, you'll read those to me, correct? And I will read the questions, yeah, exactly. Perfect. So one of the major coverages or major uh, property and casualty or auto insurance we're not going to spend much time on today, but it certainly is an important part. Um, today's focus is primarily on the homeowner insurance, the condos, the landlord, as we talked about that as well. We're going to talk a little bit about earthquake insurance, and uh, we'll touch on flood insurance as well, especially, you know, again, given what's happened recently. We're going to spend some time talking about insurance for valuable objects and valuable property. This is one of the most often overlooked sections that we come across when we're reviewing people's policies. We'll spend a little bit of time on the liability coverage, oops, liability insurance, um, umbrella insurance, and then another aspect of property and casualty, which we're not going to talk about today, but certainly could, if anybody had questions down the road we could discuss, is business insurance. So when I'm looking at property and casualty insurance, I have a basic philosophy. And the idea of insurance is 
what I like to say is to protect you against the big stuff, the big things that can happen. Now, a lot of times people approach it, it's like, how do I get cheap insurance? How do I lower my costs? So the way we work with that is we use deductibles. So for those of you who are not familiar with a deductible, that's essentially how much towards a loss you might you might pay. And for those of you who are better you know, financially off, might be able to carry a higher deductible, which means you're taking on more risk. But what that does is it also lowers the rate. So again, those things you can't afford to, to do on your own is what should be insured. And those things that you can take on on your own might be something that you would be willing to take on. And in that way, that's how we can work with the price. So that's kind of the philosophy we like to look at when we're dealing with property and casualty insurance. So let's talk a little bit about the main topic, homeowner insurance. So your homeowner insurance policy has several parts to it. Um, and it's probably kind of um, something you, you you would think about if somebody asked you, you could probably come up with these parts on your own, but we're gonna spend a few minutes on each one just describing them. So the first part is the dwelling. This is the part that ensures the home itself. What happens if my home burns down? You know, replacing my home, replacing anything that's attached to my home. So when we're talking about the dwelling, we are talking about anything that would be permanently attached. So if you picked up your home and shook it upside down, anything that fell out, would be under a different area of insurance. Anything that would stay attached would be part of your dwelling coverage. So one of the questions we get is, well, what am I actually covered for? Well, most homeowner policies cover you for, for major things, the fire, smoke damage, vandalism, uh, they may cover you for um, explosion, uh, water losses. And I wanna spend a few moments on water losses because this is one of the hardest things that people don't really get. So when they do cover water losses, homeowner policies will for your structure, meaning like damage to the wall or something like that. But they only cover it if you have what's called sudden and accidental. Those are the actual insurance terms that are used. And essentially that just means you leave your house in the morning, everything looks good. You come home after work and all of a sudden you're standing in three inches of water. That's sudden and accidental. That's different than you leave in the morning and you come back the you know later that evening you see a little tiny brown spot on your ceiling and you're like yeah I'm not going to really worry about it and then you come back the next day and it's a little bit bigger then a little bit bigger that's not sudden and accidental that's something that's damaged that's occurring over time in a slow leak those sorts of things aren't covered whereas the sudden and accidental is so that always comes up with with the home structure the other th question that comes up a lot with home structures is well, gee, my home is older. So does that mean it's not worth as much to replace? And the answer is no. When the insurance companies value your home, and we'll talk a little bit more about how they do that in the next slide, but when they do that, they're looking at what it costs to replace new. No insurance company is gonna walk in and go, hey, you know what, we have a great used window that's gonna fit in that spot since that window was broken. Everything that they do is gonna be replaced new with like kind and quality, meaning of a similar type. They're not gonna upgrade it, but they're not gonna put in a used window, even if your window is you know, 20 years old. Um, so that covers that section. Um, the next, oops. Okay, other structures. So these are things that are not attached to your home. This may be a pool. Uh, this could be like a shed out in the backyard. It could be a built-in barbecue. It could be a pool home um, or pool, like one of those pool houses. Uh, one of the things that we see often are separate garages or detached garages that have living quarters on top of it. All those kinds of things have their own coverage. So typically what you see in a home policy, if you've ever looked at your policy, you'll see all sorts of different values put on these things. And again, we'll talk about where the dwelling value comes from, but all the other coverages we're gonna talk about turn out to be percentages of the dwelling coverage. As an example, if your dwelling coverage is a half a million or $500,000, what you typically see for other structures is 10%, meaning you're gonna see $50,000. Now, you have the ability to raise that limit, you never have the ability to go below that limit. So the insurance companies are always gonna give you a package policy, at least to start with, and then it's up to you to work with your broker to decide, do I need more coverage in that area? So again, typically other structures come out at about 10% with most policies. Personal property. So if you remember my example about picking up your house and shaking it out, anything that would actually fall out is considered personal property. Another way to think about it is if you moved out of your house, what would you take with you? You know, what, what comes with you and what stays with the house? What comes with you is your personal property. 
this is usually somewhere around 60 to 75 percent of the dwelling number. The idea being is, hey, if you have a large house with a higher value um, of replacement, because there's more to replace, you probably have more stuff to replace. And that's kind of the general philosophy. Where this gets tricky and somebody and people really need to think about it is, you may have a smaller house in a very you know affluent area, but you may have very expensive furniture, very expensive clothing, and all sorts of other items that if you added it up together, might actually exceed the number that the insurance company has given you. Again, at that point, that's a conversation you should be having with your broker to make sure that you have adequate coverage. The last thing you wanna find out is that you didn't have adequate coverage after the loss has occurred. The other part that I wanna talk about is a little bit about claim settlement when we're dealing with both personal property and dwelling. What most companies will do Let's say you have a loss of some sort, whether it be a theft loss, a fire loss, but something that, that you know, as a result, you've had this loss. What most insurance companies will do is they'll get an inventory. They'll ask you for an inventory and of what you had. They're not going to ask for receipts typically. Um, you know, if there's a fire, they know you had a sofa. They know you had a dining room table. I mean, so typically you're not going to have to justify everything unless it's out of the ordinary. But what they are going to do is they're going to give you what's called actual cash value for it. They're going to say, okay, well, that set of golf clubs was, you know, you've had it for three years, um, you know, bought it new for $1,000. It may only be worth $500 now. And then as you go and replace it, then, and you replaced it and it cost you $1,000, then they will pay you the difference. The idea being is the insurance company is only going to pay the cost to replace something for something you actually replaced. If you choose not to replace something, then they're only going to give you the value of it at the time of the loss. And that value would be depreciated, meaning it would be a little bit lower than what you might have expected it to cost new. So that's how the insurance companies will settle that sort of thing. The next area of coverage is loss of use. This is really important. So you've had a fire at your house. You can't live in your house for the next three or four months. Meanwhile, you have to put stuff in storage. Um, you may have to live in a hotel for one or two weeks until you figure out what's up. Uh, you may then have to go rent a short-term rental, which is not going to be very inexpensive, certainly more than what you're paying for your mortgage. And then you got to pay to move everything back in. And then you have meals out and all those kinds of things. All those extra costs above and beyond what you would have paid for your mortgage had you lived there are covered under loss of use. So you're still going to end up paying your mortgage. But at the same time, all these additional costs are going to be reinsured, uh, reimbursed by the insurance company under what's called loss of use. And then the last key coverage of a homeowner policy or the key section is called liability. So liability is when you are held accountable for something. Somebody blames you, you are either sued for something or as a result of the term will be your negligence. You didn't tell somebody that there was a big hole in the ground and they tripped and fell in it and broke their ankle. All those kinds of things are covered under liability. Now, the interesting thing about liability is liability is not limited to being at your house. So for example, you could be walking your dog and your dog attacks somebody, you know, the neighbor or the neighbor's dog while you're down the block you're still covered. Your liability follows you wherever you go. Um, we had a great story where we had, um, and it also covers all your family members as well. We had a kid that was playing with a Wii, you know, one of those um, electronic games, and it was a game where they were playing uh, tennis. And he kept, you know, he was serving the way you would play tennis on one of those games, and he accidentally let go of the controller, and the controller went right through the screen of this new plasma TV the time as a plasma TV were, were new. And it was a five or $6,000 TV. And of course he was liable for the damage he caused to his friend's TV. And ultimately the liability picked that up because he was liable for that damage. So again, it doesn't have to be at your particular location in order for there to be coverage. Hey John. Yes. I have a couple of questions on um, okay. on the previous slide, on the homeowner's insurance slide. Okay. Um, first of all, for the, the dwelling amount and the personal property, since they're all kind of related to the dwelling, is that something that different insurance providers have different values for? So let's say, for example, my house is worth $500,000, using your example, but I really only have like $100,000 of, of, of goods. I'm not materialistic. If my policy has a $250,000, like the 50% um, personal property limit, 
is there some, are there different insurers that have different limits for that? So I can kind of only pay for the coverage that I need? Um, the, the limits, the, there are different limits, but nothing would go below 50%. And, and the majority of the preferred companies are at about 70%. So even if you had less, there would be no way to to get less and, and try to save money. There's there's no way to do that. You can't buy it all a cart. Gotcha. And then for the personal property, uh, you kind of mentioned replacement costs being something that they'll only pay you if you actually replace the item. Is there the kind of the replacement cost provision in homeowners insurance? Is that go around that, or is that um, is that what you're talking about specifically? That that is what I'm talking about. That provision with okay. most carriers will say if it, you know somewhere in the policy language essentially. Um, will say something to the effect, if you replace it, they will pay the difference. Um, most companies, if it's something really small, like there, I've seen limits of 2,500 or 5,000, meaning you get a small theft and it was, you know, $3,000 theft, um, they're not going to go through that trouble of saying, okay, here's, you know, 2,000 now and we'll give you 1,000 later if you show us you replaced everything. So typically on a small claim like that, they'll just pay, go ahead and pay the replacement cost. But on a larger claim, they want to see that, that you've actually replaced those items. Great to know. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about market value versus insured value. This is one of the things that a lot of people get tripped up on. So we talked about in the last slide about dwelling costs and and you know that number like 500,000 we used. But a lot of people will say, well, wait a second, but my house is worth $750,000. And that's absolutely true. That would be the market value of your house. The replacement costs or the costs that the insurance companies use are the cost it would take to rebuild your house with the same features new today. And of course, if you think about it, you could take the same house and let's say, let's take a 2,000 square foot house in Beverly Hills. Um, a house like that is certainly going to be over a million dollars, you know, whatever the actual market value is, but it's going to be worth over a million dollars. If we picked up that house and took it, moved it out to Barstow, you know, that same house might only cost one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand dollars market value. But the fact is, the cost to rebuild the house is going to be roughly the same in both areas. So the insurance companies, the numbers that they use, don't always have a um, they're not always collated to um, to the, the 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 value that you're used to thinking of your house. And the third value that sometimes comes up is mortgages, because the the mortgage, how much you have on the mortgage. Because some banks say we want you to insure to the value of the mortgage. Well, the value of the mortgage may actually be greater. Again, that Beverly Hills home may actually be greater than the actual cost to insure. And usually, there's a a line somewhere in there when you're doing a loan that says, or to the value that the insurance company deems worthy to insure the house for. So there's these different values out there, but for your home, from your insurance policy, it's gonna be based on the actual cost to replace or to rebuild. So how is that determined? How does an insurance company determine, you know, you talk to your broker and you say, I have this house and it's 2,500 square feet and everything, and all of a sudden you get your quote back or proposal and there's this number there and you're like, wow, how did they get to that number? Well, all insurance companies use a third party program. Most of them use the same program actually, um, that they put in certain information about your home. So if you go back and think about when you bought insurance for your home, you probably had people asking you questions about, you know, how big is it? You know, is your kitchen been updated? Um, you know, what kind of flooring do you have? Do you have one air conditioning unit or two? And it's just a whole sorts of questions. And they use that, put that into the, you know, basically the computer program and come up with the replacement cost of your home. Now, realistically, that's, uh, there's a lot of assumptions built into a program like that. So, you know, how do you know, gosh, am I actually adequately insured? He didn't ask about the crown molding I had in my ceiling, and I know that cost me $5,000 to put in. How's that being covered? So all the insurance companies also do what's called extended replacement cost, and you want to make sure that your policy has this. Extended replacement cost says, okay, they're going to insure your home for whatever amount shows on your policy, and again, I'll use the 500000 And then they add a percentage over and above that. So that percentage is anywhere as low as 20% I've seen all the way up to 100%, or I guess you could say 200%. It doubles the coverage, however you want to say it. So that $500,000 home, you would actually have up to $600,000 to 
rebuild it if you had the 20% extended, or you'd have up to a million dollars to rebuild it if you had the 100% extended. So that should cover most things that you would potentially miss or haven't been um, asked about or maybe a slightly upgraded feature that hasn't been accounted for. Um, now there's a danger, and there, there's an inherent danger in that. Some brokers say, hey, we know this house, you know, really costs like 500,000 to rebuild based on their program. So what they'll do is they'll say, what we'll do is we're only gonna charge you um, for 350,000 for your house. And then we're gonna let that extended coverage pick up the rest to get you up to 500,000. And there's a big danger in that. First of all, it means all the other numbers that are percentages off, off of it may not be accurate. But more importantly, you run into issues where what happens if there's something like an earthquake? So with earthquake insurance, you don't get that extended replacement. It's just the number that's on the policy. Well, two things happen after an earthquake. One, an earthquake is one of those things that's most likely to really cause a lot of damage to your house. But also, it's one of those things that if it hits you, it's probably hitting everybody else around you. So what happens at that point, you get what's called demand surge. That, and this has actually happened um, in the um, recent fires up that were in Northern California and certainly now in Ventura County, is you have all these people who need contractors to fix their homes. So there's a demand for contractors. Well, what do you think the contractors are doing? They're of course raising their rates. Of course, they're also having to buy supplies and having to either go further for supplies or pay extra for their supplies because the supplies are in demand. So if you've tried to, I'll call it cheat the system and not have proper coverage on the house and use the extended replacement to make up the difference, you could actually find yourself incredibly underinsured. And that is actually happening. We've heard many stories about that, even with these most recent claims. Um, just to give you an idea, because you're like, well, how do I know? Um, I would tell you that typically here in Southern California, an average house, an average track home, say in the San Fernando Valley, you're probably wanting to see the number come up somewhere between at least $175 to $200 a square foot for your house. Um, you start to get into the nicer, more custom houses, and you're probably looking at closer to $400 or $500 per square foot for those you know, nice houses in, you know, wherever they're all over the valley, I suppose, in the you know, West Lake Village and all those areas. So that's a quick check. Most insurance companies, if your cost is over a million dollars, if they've determined, you know, if, the, if an agent has determined that that's what the cost is, they're going to probably come out and do a, a field inspection anyway, an interior inspection, and want to see the house and look at the features. So at that point, they'll probably do a more accurate assessment. But just to give you an idea, those are some of the numbers that you want to think about. Um, hey, John. Talking about that demand, yeah. So uh, as related to, to this slide, um, what is, what's a question or what can somebody who's talking to their insurance broker and, and let's say it's not you for sake of argument, um, what do they say to make sure that they're going to end up being covered as fully as they need to be covered versus somebody who's trying to come in with the lowest bid and do that trick where they, they use that, uh, the, uh, the float, uh, 30 sure. percent or whatever. Right. What can they say to make sure that they're, they're, appropriately yeah. covered without obviously overpaying for something that they should be getting anyway. Good, good question, Matt. What, what you can do, most renewals come out, um, you know, most people just look at the, the price, but if you dig deeper into it, the renewals have a set of um, features that the value is based on. Um, some give you more information than others, but you can look at that set of features and say, is this accurate for my home? You know, maybe you've redesigned your kitchen or you know any number of different things, but you want to look and make sure that's accurate. If there's not enough there, if they only give you just like square footage and you're built and you know really nothing else about it, you can ask your broker for the report that's used, and they can go back into their system and basically pull up that report, and you can kind of walk through it and go, yeah, this makes sense. These are the features I have, or gee, I didn't have that, or I do have that, or you know, whatever the case may be. So that's that's the check case. They can ask for a copy of the report if they'd like one. That's great. Thank okay. you very much. Sure. Um, so let's talk about some special coverage for valuable objects. Um, all homeowner policies, across the board have limits for certain things. And this is one of those things that most people don't know about. So certain valuable objects, 
They have limits for um, anywhere from like $2,500 up to $5,000. And it, and it really, this varies by, by company. So some of the key items are jewelry, um, fine art, uh, silverware, guns, um, computers, and other collectibles, things like you know baseball cards, comic books, or if you collect like Yadro or you know some of those things. Different companies have different limits. What's just important to know that if you have something unique or something valuable, you want to make sure that it is being adequately covered. And the way to do that typically is through increased coverage. You may have heard the term floaters or riders, and these are endorsements or basically add-ons to your policy to cover these items either a higher limit that's one way to do it you can raise the limit that the company gives you or you can buy a specific it's called a specific floater like i have this one diamond ring it's worth twenty thousand dollars and the insurance company says okay give us an appraisal a current appraisal and then they will insure that ring for twenty thousand dollars so if something happens to it they're just going to hand you a twenty thousand dollar check there's no question about how much it's worth. It, all that is handled up front with the appraisal. And then the third way you can do it is what's called a blanket um, floater, where you say, I have all these items of jewelry, and they're worth maybe you know $1,000 each, but I have 20 of them for $20,000. You can buy a blanket floater for $20,000, and at that point, you don't have to get appraisals on each item or anything. And for your benefit, it makes sense to keep a certainly an inventory list. But at that way, um, you have the extra coverage you need. And those floaters, the reason that makes them more valuable is they also offer things like mysterious disappearance. For example, oh my God, I can't find my ring. I don't know what happened to it. Or, oh my God, I looked at my ring and the diamond just fell off. I'll give you a great story. We had a client who had a floater on a ring and when he took the ring to get it cleaned, he got it back and he looked at it and just something didn't seem right about it. He took it to a different jeweler and the jeweler said, oh, there's that's not a diamond in there anymore. That's a, um, a cubic zirconia. The guy he took it to switched out the diamond and put in a cubic zirconia. And as a result, and it turned out it was a whole criminal case and everything like that. But the fact is the insurance company paid for it because it was a mysterious disappearance that would not have been covered by a regular, just a regular standard homeowner policy. So that's the benefit of these floaters. And again, you can do that for any of these types of items. The other item that I didn't list on here originally is things like cash. Um, all policies at the most will go up to maybe $500 or $1,000 for cash. If so, if you keep a lot of cash at home and something happens to it, chances of you getting re, being able to recover most of it are, are pretty slim. So that's just something to be thinking about if you were thinking keeping at home is a safe place. The one thing we recommend here is doing an inventory of your house. Um, there are people out there that do video inventories uh, or, or just do your own walking inventory of your house. So God forbid something happens, you're in a position to say, oh, that's right, I had 10 dress suits and you know not just the five I can remember that I wore all the time. It's, you know, those kinds of things will help settle a claim quickly, will make sure that you're adequately, you know, have everything inventoried and it just makes everything work much easier if there should be some sort of claim. So move on from hey, there. John, we got another yeah. good question here. Okay, great. Um so if you have a classic car, like a collectible car, is that something that's going to be covered under your homeowner's insurance or a, a valuable personal property insurance policy as a standalone, or is that something that you cover under your auto insurance? Like, let's say you don't even drive it. Yeah, it, it's actually, it's a good question. Anything that's a motorized vehicle is not, cannot be covered under a homeowner policy unless like it's a golf cart or something. So in that mm -hmm. case, a classic car would be covered under a car, an auto policy of some sort. There actually are yeah. classic car policies too, to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about, Condo coverage, I'm gonna speed it up a little bit because I'm noticing the time here a bit. Um, so condo coverages, a lot of people don't think, hey, I have a condo, the association covers it, I don't really need coverage. I wanna address this in a couple areas fairly quickly. One is the association doesn't cover your belongings. So the fact is if something happens, that's still a, a large financial loss to you that you would have to deal with. Um, so it certainly would be something to look at. Um, 
condos, the majority of them, probably about 95% of them, don't cover your interior building coverage. That could be your cabinetry, that your your toilets, your um, sinks, your you know anything that's on the inside wall. They they call it walls in is typically the word that's used. All of that is your responsibility. So if there's damage to something inside, the association isn't responsible, and you are. So this would be something again for condo that you would want coverage for. Uh, going back to that loss of use coverage, if you had to move out because there was damage to your condo, where would you go or how would you pay for it because you're still going to be paying your mortgage? So the loss of use coverage is an important part of this uh, condo as well. Liability, same thing. You know, if that person I talked about with the we you know, lived in a condo and didn't have a condo policy, they wouldn't have had the liability to to pay for that. So another thing to consider. And then finally, loss assessment. So if you're part of an HOA, or homeowners association, they have the ability to assess you for certain things. Well, under certain conditions, that assessment can be paid for by your insurance company. Um, don't want to get into all the details about it so it doesn't cover everything, but you can add loss assessment on a condo policy. You can add $25,000 worth of coverage for roughly $10 a year. So we're not talking about a huge impact, but again, it's something if the assessment, if there is an assessment from the HOA, this certainly is something that you would want to consider consider. Uh, let's see, anything else? And then turns out a lot of banks now, when you get loans on condos, they are actually requiring certain coverage. So we are seeing more coverage on condos than we had previously, but it is one of those things where until, unless a bank forces you to do it, a lot of people weren't doing it, but we want to make sure people understand the reason to do it. Landlords, some of you may own property where you have a renter inside. So I want to address that fairly quickly. The first part of a landlord is if it's a home, you have the same replacement cost issues that you had with your own home, the dwelling coverage. The coverages will look essentially the same, but you still have to worry about is it insured adequately? So you have that particular part of it. You have the policy must be set up as non-owner occupied, meaning you can't be in a home and then you decide, okay, I'm going to move to another home and I'm going to rent my first home and not change the type of policy it is. That's going to cause you all sorts of problems if there is a claim because the insurance company actually would have the ability to say, hey, the exposure here has changed dramatically. It's not you living here. It's somebody we didn't even know living here. You know what? We're going to decline coverage. They have the ability to do that because you didn't tell them about a substantial change in hazard. So you want to make sure that anybody that you have a rent, you know, where you're renting, that it's set up as non-owner occupied. Uh, personal belongings. You may furnish the home. You may not furnish the home. Now, this goes back to the question Matt asked earlier. Well, what happens if I don't really furnish the home, so I have very little product or very little personal belongings there? Um, in that case, on the landlord's policies, most of them have like real small limits of like $7,500 or $10,000. So it's a very, very small limit. If you have less than that, you still got to take their minimum, but at least you're not paying for coverage for, you know, some sort of percentage of the replacement cost of the home. So, um, but if you do have more there, then you have the ability to increase it. Loss of rent. So something happens at the home and your renter can't live there. Well, your renter needs to have their own renter insurance to live somewhere else temporarily, but you are losing that rental income because of course they're not going to pay you to, you know, they, they, your contract price says that they don't have to keep paying you. You've lost that rental income. So if that home is uninhabitable due to a covered loss, then the loss of rent picks up that difference. And I touched on really quick there about the renter policy for a tenant. We recommend to all of our clients, if you have a home that you're leasing or renting to somebody else, that you absolutely should include in your contract that they maintain a renter policy for themselves. This does two things. One, it makes sure that they understand that you're not responsible for their stuff if something happens to their stuff. But two, it also gives them liability coverage. So if their dog bite somebody, you know, it's not going to come back to you. They have a policy to cover it. So it's essentially, um, it provides a layer of coverage for you and just to give you an idea, renter policies start as low as $150 for a year for a basic renter policy. So we're not talking about a significant cost to your tenant. Um, and again, liability. You want to make sure that there's that when you're renting a house, that there's that you have your own liability. So if somebody trips and falls or gets hurt there, or your tenant gets hurt there for some reason due a con 
due to some condition, that you're covered. The other advantage of, of, of liability on a landlord policy, certain carriers actually have wrongful eviction and invasion of privacy. So let's say you try to evict your client because they haven't paid for three months, perfectly legitimate reason to evict them. They say you're evicting them because their hair is purple. And so they've decided that they're going to sue you because you're evicting them, for, you know, you're being discriminatory in your eviction process. You may be fully right, you're still gonna to have to defend yourself, you're still gonna to have to get an attorney. So this um, wrongful eviction provides that coverage for you, pays for that attorney. If for some reason it turns out you were guilty in some way of wrongful eviction, it pays that claim as well for you. So um, these are important coverages to have if you're a landlord, and they're only offered by select companies. So it's something to take a look at with your, um, you know, with your broker. So we talked about wrongful eviction, invasion, privacy. Let's talk about earthquake really quick. Um, er earthquake. Just to give me about 20% of people carry earthquake coverage. Um, obviously, we live in earthquake country, and the, the, the biggest obstacle is, hey, earthquake coverage is expensive. So there are multiple carriers for earthquake now. There's the CEA, California Earthquake Authority, and other carriers. Um, you have deductibles. So, of course, you've heard that earthquake coverages have large deductibles. They do. They used to only offer a large deductible of 15%. Now you can get deductibles as low as 5%, down to even 2.5%. So they've made a lot of strides in the earthquake deductibles. And the way the deductible works, and this is just a question we get a lot, so I want to address it quickly, is does that mean I need to pay that money first? So let's say you have a $100,000 home, just to make the math easy, and you have a 15% deductible. The question always comes up, does that mean I have to come up with $15,000 before the earthquake company will pay or the insurance will pay? And the answer is no. What they're going to do is they're going to say, okay, you have a $15,000 deductible. You had $50,000 worth of damage. They will turn around and basically the settlement would then become $35,000, the $50,000 minus the deductible. And so there would be $35,000 there for you to use, but you don't have to come up with the 15% deductible. What's important is different companies apply deductibles to different coverages. And so it's really important to look at this and understand how your deductibles work for your coverage. And again, your broker should be able to explain it for you. Coverage for pools. Just because you have an earthquake policy doesn't mean you have a coverage for your pool. In fact, if you have a California earthquake policy, California Earthquake Association policy, there is no coverage for pools. So that's not usually something that people ask. Um, and obviously pools are one of the first things to get damaged in earthquakes. So you might wanna look at one of the other carriers um, potentially for earthquake coverage if you have a pool. Um, personal belongings and breakables. So earthquake covers personal belongings, things that break, but what they don't cover are breakables. So all of your dishes fall out of the the cabinet, your glassware falls out of the cabinet, none of that stuff is covered um, unless you actually add a breakable endorsement. And California Earthquake Authority is the only one that has a breakable endorsement. So um, again, little minor differences between the policies that could have a major impact when there's actually a settlement. And it's just good to understand how those work before, you know, obviously an earthquake would hit. Loss of use is important. Um, very, very important here. California Earthquake Authority used to only offer $1,500. Well, if you think about it, if you have to move out after an earthquake, $1,500 is going to get you a hotel stay for a week. Then what do you do? Um, they've actually raised it. Now they go up to $100,000. Well, a lot of brokers haven't gone back and gone over that with their clients. So if you've had California Earthquake Authority for a while, for more than like three or four years, you may want to go back to your broker and say, hey, can I get additional coverage here? And it's actually very inexpensive coverage. So it might be something um, to certainly consider. And then loss assessment condos. Um, this is a huge issue. So you're, if you own a condo, and your association carries earthquake coverage, you might think all is great. But if you think about it, they're carrying the amount of insurance that covers all the condos, all that structure. So that might be multi-millions of dollars. So let's just use a $10 million example. And we've seen this happen. If it's a $10 million condo and they have a 15% deductible, it means the association's deductible is $1.5 million. Well, I don't know any association that carries one and a half million dollars in their reserves. So what happens is they have the right to then go ahead and assess all the unit owners to make up that deductible. Well, in most buildings, that is anywhere from 25 to 35 up to $40,000 that they could assess you. 
Well, now you're stuck because now you owe that assessment. You can't sell your condo with that assessment on there, or at least you have to disclose it. And the new owner has to take on that assessment. But if you have lost assessment for earthquake on an earthquake policy, that can be paid. So it's really primarily for a condo, but it's one of those coverages that's missed a lot when we're looking, reviewing policies. So just wanted to bring that to attention. Um, liability. We talked a little bit about liability. Um, so some things to think about how much liability should I have? How do I know? Well, things to think about are how, what's your exposure to liability? You know, if you're two um, retired people living in a condo, your, re, your liability limit or your liability needs may be lower than a young family that has kids, has a pool in the backyard, place structures, animals, all these different things that could lead to a loss. So that's one thing that should be factored in. Um, personal injury. So this is left off a lot of policies. This is part of liability. And you may have heard the terms libel and slander. I'll give you a great example where this has come up just recently uh, with one of our clients. We had a gentleman who was in, um, uh, actually worked for me at one point, and he was doing a, um, oh, what's not quick start, or what's that thing uh, where you have, uh, you put money, people, you open up a campaign so people can do donate money to a good cause. I'm just drawing a blank on, on the name of it. Oh, funny. GoFundMe. He did a GoFundMe. And the GoFundMe was for a lady at his church who had complained that her husband wasn't paying the child support he was supposed to be paying, and she was really struggling. So he and his friend said, hey, let's do a GoFundMe account and help this lady out. So they put that out there and said, you know, she's really struggling. She's not, you know, getting all of her child support payments that she needs. Can you help her? Well, the, the ex-husband was also a member of the church and saw this and said, well, wait a second. I'm paying all the child support that I should be paying. And it essentially sued the, our client for for committing, I'm not sure which one's liable or slander, but in, in putting in writing and basically disparaging his name and ultimately went back and forth, back and forth because, you know, there was some truth to what he was saying, but it wasn't fully truthful. When, when all was said and done, over $20,000 was paid from the insurance policy to that ex-husband for the disparaging remarks that was made, made about his name. And that was only because we added the $20 endorsement for personal injury to liability. So that's just a classic example of somebody who's trying to do good, don't think about anything that's going on, and would have been, you know, would have had a serious issue had he not had this coverage. And we do see that coverage missed a lot on policies. Um, let's see, workers' compensation and employees, if you employ somebody um, that is going to be like a, a, a full-time person in your house, like maybe a caretaker for somebody, if they don't have their own workers' compensation, you actually can add it through your homeowner policy. So that's something to consider. Um, and again, your potential exposure in terms of loss. If you're somebody who has you know, a lot of money put away or you've done well financially or you have a good income, you have a higher exposure to loss than somebody who doesn't have those items. And that should factor into how much liability you should have as well. We actually use a model where we can help people figure out based on their financial situation, how much liability they should have. And of course, you know, the natural thing is, well, sure, more liability is gonna cost me more money. Just to give you an idea, the difference between um, $100,000 liability, which is usually a base policy, and a half million dollar liability is roughly $30 a year on an annual basis for a, for a home policy. So we're not talking about a significant cost difference in order to get significant coverage. And again, back to that, protect yourself against the big stuff. Um, Umbrella, and I think this is our last slide before we go into Q&A. Um, so umbrella policy, what's an umbrella policy? So umbrella is also liability, meaning, oops, there's music. Um, wow. Matt, should I be hearing music? Oh, I don't you. hear music, but oh, uh, I heard yeah. music. I, that's good, okay. Um, umbrella policy is basically, it's a, uh, it's an extension over and above your liability. So not only does it go above the liability on the home that we've talked about and give you an increased level, because maybe 500,000 isn't enough, it also goes over your car liability. So if you ran somebody over and really injured them and it was more than your car limits were, your auto um, insurance limits were, the umbrella goes over that. One of the things that people confuse it with is they say, if my home's not insured enough, will it protect me to you know, make up for the difference on my home? And the answer is no, it's only liability. So that's what an umbrella policy will do. Um, and again, it comes down to 
what do you have at risk? If you really injured somebody severely, what could they come after? You know, if you have multiple rental properties or you have a nice, um, you know, chunk of money put in the bank or you have a good income, all those things are something that people could come after. Um, and, and so are your risks higher than normal? So for example, maybe you entertain a lot at your house and you have parties where people are doing a lot of drinking, or maybe you do have a pool and you host a lot of pool parties at your house for the Girl Scout troop or any of these different things. All of those are things to be thinking about, or maybe you have a teenage driver who you know probably drives a little faster than he should. All these things are things you should be thinking about when you're thinking about potential for an umbrella. Um, Rental properties, if you have a rental property, it's probably a good sign that you would need an umbrella. Um, one of the common questions about an umbrella before we start the Q&A really is, how much is an umbrella? And just to give you a rough idea, uh, two cars, you know, most people have two or, two or three cars with a home and a rental, that might cost you around $350 a year for a $1 million rental, or $1 million umbrella. So we're not talking, again, a significant cost and a lot of times that difference can be you can make up that difference by taking some higher deductibles on some of your other policies and that would save you the 350 dollars you might need to buy an umbrella so those are the types of things that you should be looking at and you should be going over with your broker if you have questions so um, i think and i know we kind of sped through the last part there pretty quickly but i'll take any questions matt that might have yeah, we have up. some good questions. We have some good okay. questions here. Um, so, if you have a significant other that lives with you, are they covered by your policy? Yeah, significant other, assuming that they're not married or any of that kind of stuff. The answer is no. Um, in order for somebody to be covered under the policy, they either have to be a family member by definition, or they have to have an ownership interest in the property. So, if you live with your girlfriend and you, you know, you own the house, your girlfriend's stuff isn't covered and your girlfriend's liability is not covered. She would need her technically a renter policy to protect herself. That's interesting. Um, okay, that's good to know. Next question is: Am I covered? by my home policy if I have a home-based business. Like if I work out of my house, am I, am I covered? Uh, yeah, uh, for this? this is one of those, it depends, but typically homeowner policies exclude business liability, meaning that if you have clients coming to your office, um, your home-based office, and they slip and fall, that's not gonna be covered by your, your home insurance. Um, also not typically covered by your home insurance is your what's called business personal property. Um, most, I shouldn't say it like that, most policies will give you maybe $1,500, $2,000 worth for some business equipment that you might have at your house. Um, um, but again, they're not going to cover you for the liability or if in your business you do something that in some way damages somebody else, um, there's going to be no extension for that. We typically recommend that you have a business policy for your business on top of your actual home policy. Okay, gotcha. Uh, another one, this one's a little bit longer. If you currently live in a rental property in one state, but you own a home in a different state and split your time between the two, do you still need a renter's insurance policy for the rental, or will your other state's homeowner's insurance policy cover any losses at the rental? Does that make sense? Wait, so let me let me repeat that back, make sure I understand. Do you own both places? Is that the deal? No, and one's like a one secondary dwelling? Other. Right, you, so you own one and you rent the other, but you, yeah. you, you still go back and forth. The rental one, you still might go to right. that one like as a vacation thing. Yeah, at, right. at that point, you're, you're good because both policies will have, um, since you own both, it, as long as you spend time in both, then your policies on both of those would cover you for whatever you have there. So your personal property that's located in each spot will be covered, your loss of use, your loss of rent. Um, you're, you're good in both places. Gotcha. By having a policy, but you need a policy on both homes. If if that was the original question, but you don't oh, okay. need a yeah, third. That... Yeah, you don't need a third rental policy, um, in what you're describing. At least in the way I understand, I understand that scenario. I understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I think one more here. If I have coverage for personal property on my house, is my child covered in their dorm room, um, or apartment for any oh. property or casualty related issues? Good question. So kid goes off to college, what do you do? So the answer is, yes, you do have coverage, but I would always recommend not to use it. Let me rephrase, let me take that back just for a second. <laughs> so Insurance. all the policies have an extension of coverage that if you have coverage you know, located somewhere else, or if you have property located somewhere else, they'll give you up to $1,000 worth of coverage. 
okay? So it's not a lot. Now you think about your student going away somewhere else, they may not have much more than $1,000, but they, you know, maybe their closed computer, maybe it's two or $3,000. The reason why I say you won't want to use that coverage is first of all, you probably have a deductible anyhow. I mean, chances are what's going to happen to your kid is their laptop was stolen or something along those lines, their bike was stolen. It's something that's probably under your deductible to begin with or just over your deductible. You don't want to file a claim in that case anyway, because you don't want the loss in your record because you're going to pay more in higher rates for the next three years than you would have recovered under that loss. What we recommend in those particular cases is there are policies out there for college students. Um, you, know, you can just go online and look look them up. We don't happen to sell them through here, but they um, they're maybe one or two hundred dollars a year, and they cover things that aren't even covered by a regular policy. So if they spilled a beer onto their computer, like that would never happen in college. But you know, supposing something like that happened and it fried <laughs> their computer, that sort of thing is covered under these college policies. And the good news is that claim never shows up on your history. History, which means it doesn't impact your rates. So that's really what we recommend in those kinds of scenarios uh, when a kid is away at college to get the special college policy if they're worried. Now the liability, How much are those? a couple hundred bucks a year tops. Um, the liability does extend to the kids. So if that kid does do something and you know causes an injury to somebody else, then the homeowner policy that you have would extend coverage to to your son or daughter at that point. So you're you're okay with that piece. Great. Well, I think that's the last question. Uh, John, thanks so much for your time. I know um, your contact information is contained in the webinar. And Great, yes. um, people can feel free to give you a call or email. And this webinar has also been recorded, so it'll be available um, on our blog. And I'm sure John will have it available uh, for yes. consumption uh, as well. Right. All right. Well, Matt, thank you very much for giving me the time and uh, appreciate the time. Appreciate all the people out there uh, taking a chance, taking the time to listen. Thank you. All right.